You know, sometimes you get tickled at inappropriate times. I got a confession to make. You know, Wednesday night when we were uh, having problems with the speakers just in the auditorium, uh, next thing you know, Steve's coming in and bringing these portable speakers up here, which is great. You know, speakers in foreign countries are like gold. Um, you know, they're so happy once a congregation gets speakers that they'll call a gospel meeting and try them out. And they have these huge speakers that they face towards all their neighbors. And uh, the gospel just goes out for, for as far as those speakers can go. People will be out in their porch listening. But anyway, what tickled me is I was thinking when I saw those speakers, um, I was in Tanzania one time, and like I said, it's it's an expensive commodity over there. And if you have a speaker, you're, uh, you know, it's a sign that, that you're doing okay financially, you know, for a congregation. Uh, so we were holding a gospel meeting, and they had to rent some speakers. Uh, and so the company that they rented them off, with the uh, use of the speakers for the gospel meeting, uh, one of the things that came with the price of admission uh, to renting these speakers is that during the daytime, that company would put them in the back of a truck and would go around town and advertise the meeting. So they had been doing this for a couple days. And then it just so happened when we were door knocking, uh, here comes the company that we rented the speakers off of, and this is in Tanzania, and so they're speaking Swahili over this, and I hear my name every once in a while, Mark Linald, they would say, Linald, and I was, oh, that's, that's me, you know, all this stuff, and then the next thing you know, two of the uh, guys, the Tanzanians that I was with, one of them was Christopher Makabanji, they get up and they start taking off towards this truck, and I have no idea what's going on. Well, what they had been advertising around the community for two whole days was, Mark Reynolds, come for your miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, the only other people that they had uh, rent their speakers were Pentecostal groups. And so they just thought, you know, all of us did that same thing. And so there had to be some disappointed people that, that showed up to that gospel meeting so anyway that's not what you should be thinking during worship but uh that crossed my mind today as i was looking at those speakers keeping the local local church strong that has nothing to do with the lesson today uh but keeping the local church strong we've been talking about uh for the last three weeks now including today uh, some just different uh, descriptions that the Bible gives uh, for the church. It compares it, you know, as we noticed, to a home. You know, the church is a home. And, and in that lesson, we talked about the need for general maintenance. It's, it's not something that we can ever say, well, man, we're just as good as we're ever going to be. We'll never need any repairs. There's nothing to do anymore. We've reached as high as you can go for us till Church of Christ. We're perfect. We'll never have anything to improve upon. Well, that's just not the case. It's not the case with the home that you live in. There's always something to do. Always something to do. Uh, there's always improvements to make. And we talked about uh, the home. There's sometimes there's a need for pest control. We have to take care of those things, just like the church in Corinth did with the man uh, who was not living right. Well, they had to take care of it. There was, there was times when there had to be corrections even made in the church. And then last Sunday, we looked at the description of the church is called a body and the importance of keeping a body strong by regular exercise, doing those things that would keep the body strong. And not only that, we also know that there's one body, but many members. And we talked about how every member has a, a, a work to do. Every member has a work to do. There is something for every single person here to be doing. And so, you know, just as if we were living in a house, you know, if somebody doesn't pull their fair share, well, it, it's noticed, isn't it? It's noticed. Uh, you can just see in the husband-wife relationship, you leave things out when you shouldn't. Uh, someone else has to pick them up and put them away, and, and that gets old, doesn't it? And there needs to be a fair share about that. And so we looked at the strong body last week and a wholesome diet of making sure that we're eating the right thing. Spiritually speaking, uh, the elders make sure that we are being fed as a flock, not just being fed, but being fed the right kind of spiritual food. And that's so important, not just from the pulpit, but by every classroom, making sure that people are growing and being nourished in the Lord. 
Uh, today, the final lesson of this short series is talking about marriage. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. I love this passage, and I know that you do as well, for so many reasons. You know, I look at it, and, and it's so obvious that marriage is being discussed here, but that's not the main point of this beautiful passage. In Ephesians chapter 5, starting with verse 21, you know, we usually start with 22, and that's where it's cut off. But listen to what it says. I think this is important to put with the main emphasis of this passage. Verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of God. You know, there's things that the husband submits to the wife about. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. They're submitting one to another. Uh, yes, the husband is the leader of the home, but there's some things uh, that, that uh, he submits to her in. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But then, verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So now we're seeing where he's going with this. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his fl own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. So you see again where we're going with this. He's talking about the husband and wife relationship, but what's he really talking about? Let's keep going. Verse 30, for we are all members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. Paul, I kind of get mixed reviews here. You're talking about marriage, but you keep on mentioning the word, of church, the word church. What are you talking about? Well, remove all doubt. Verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. You see that he uses a, an illustration that we're very, very familiar to, to us, the husband-wife relationship, the marriage bond. And he, as we have been showing you, the, he uses these different descriptions and illustrations, uh, the home, the, um, the body, and now he's going to just bring it on down to the husband-wife relationship. And so what is it about marriage that responds so well to the church? Let's look at just a couple things this afternoon. Number one, as we've seen that marriage is often used to describe the church in relationship to Christ, uh, we examine this image and, and we just see some powerful things. Number one, time. Time. When you think about a husband loving his wife, even as Christ loved the church, what comes to your mind? Sacrifice to me. But not only that, how much effort did Jesus put into his bride, the church? Well, that's why he came, isn't it? He came to establish that so all the redeemed could be married to him, they could come to God and be a member of that body, be all united in one place. What was Christ willing to do to make this happen, to make this come true, to make this a reality? Well, he was willing to do everything, including laying down his own life. There's sacrifice, and not just that, but that's everything Christ did while he was on this earth had to do with building up that future body when he would establish, when he would build his church. And the husband-wife relationship, you wouldn't think much of a husband who never had any time for his family, would you? And that happens far too often. And I realize that the uh, man will often go to work and be gone most of the day, but when he comes back, what does he do with that time that he has with his family? Does he, does he make the most of that time? Does he have that free time? Does he do spend the weekends uh, with his family to, to strengthen that bond in the home? And if you say no, then we all would think less of that man, wouldn't we? But what's the overall here uh, issue here? What's the overall theme? What's the point he's trying to make? We're not talking just about husband and wife. Yes, that is important. But Paul says what we're actually talking about is that great mystery I speak concerning Christ and the church. 
And so if a husband cannot be a really good husband without devoting time and effort and sacrifice for his marriage, how good of a Christian can I be if I don't devote any time, sacrifice to the bride of Christ? Would you consider me to be a faithful Christian? Would you consider me to be a working Christian? Would you consider me to be one who is all invested in this great work if I never have any time, effort, or sacrifice for the bride of Christ? I want you to turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 24 now and, and just think about this. Under the old law, you know, I realize that we are under the new law today, but under the old law, there's just some really neat nuggets in there that you read every once in a while and you think, man, that's a really good idea. <laughs> that's a really good idea. Deuteronomy chapter 24. You have the law concerning divorce there at the beginning, but look at verse 5. Well, how are you going to stop that? Look at verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 5. When a man has taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war or be charged with any business. He shall be free at home one year and bring happiness to his wife whom he has taken. Isn't that awesome? Especially not going to war part. That would be especially good. But having a year to go home, be with your wife, but not just that. Look what it says at the very end. And bring happiness to his wife whom he has taken. Could you imagine if for the first year of your marriage, your main goal was going to be, my main objective is, I'm going to just live to make her happy. Imagine if that was your goal in marriage for two years, or three years, or four years, or five years. Imagine if that was your goal as a husband for the rest of your life, as long as you were married to that woman. I want to make her happy the rest of our lives together. Now you take that attitude and you can see, well, that's concerning a bride, that's concerning a husband and wife. What about the church? If my goal were to do everything I can to please our Lord and to be active in his bride, the church, what happens if I dedicated more time, more effort, more sacrifice for the work of the church? What do you think would happen? Good things would happen, wouldn't they? You know, many marriages are unraveling today because couples just don't spend time together. They have different interests. They have different uh, ideas of how things ought to be done, different ideas of how they ought to spend their time. And so consequently, so many times people will just separate. And here, you know, they work all week. They come home. They have the weekend together, and they do their own separate things. There's nothing wrong with going out and doing your own things, but... If you're neglecting the time together, well, there's going to be a problem. What about in the church? Look with me to Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. Well, you don't have to turn after 20. Uh, you know, this is talking about discipline, and we understand that. But a, but a beautiful and powerful passage is uh, saying is there, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them, Jesus said. Well, that's true about discipline, and that's true about other things that we do in the name of Christ. If we're doing it by his authority, then here, there he is in the midst of us. But so many... And, and you know that this is um, probably worse than it's ever been in the history of the church. I'm, I'm guessing you, know, you can, might be able to go back and, and prove me wrong on that, and I, would, and I would say I was wrong. But it's probably worse than ever before where, you know, that number in the morning is one number. And then in the afternoon, a lot of times it's about 50%. I think we're doing a little bit better than that here at Forest Hill, but you can kind of see that. And then, you know, Wednesday night's a little bit higher than the Sunday night uh, service, but you, but you see that type of thing. And so, and then oftentimes, if you'll notice, the number from Bible study to worship, the number for Bible study is one thing. It's a lower number. But that Sunday morning worship, there it is. And I know we're not all about numbers, and, and people I know have good reasons. Other people have jobs and things like that that they do on Sunday afternoon. And to a lot of people, it's a big sacrifice to make it here uh, for Sunday morning worship. But if you think about it in this way, as we think about the husband and wife relationship, 
if you spent one hour a week with your bride, what kind of marriage do you think you would have? And if I spend one hour of week with the bride of Christ, and that's all there is, no communication throughout the week, no coming together to edify one another throughout the week. Uh, and so for one hour a week, that's the amount of time and sacrifice and effort I put into my walk with Christ. And I realize this is probably better to be said on Sunday mornings, wouldn't it? Because you're here and they're not. However, it's good to be reminded for us as well to think about how much effort are we truly giving towards our relationship with Christ. Let's look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Here's, here's, you know, you read something in the Bible and you think, man, how can you, Mark Reynolds, and I'll just talk to myself, and, and you can ask yourself if this applies to you, how can I get this attitude in me? How, how can I become more like that? When there's, as we said in the first point, there's always room for improvement. How, how can I get this attitude? Look at the attitude of those in the first century when, when the church was just born and these people realized that they had been lost and now they're saved and they're in the body of Christ that was started uh, and purchased by the blood of Christ. Watch, watch their attitude. And here's the question I have. How can I get this attitude more so in my life? Look at verse 42. Well, back up to verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Now watch. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among them all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And I'm not talking about, okay, this is what you have to do if you want to be faithful. That's not what I'm saying. We have jobs and that daily meeting together from house to house. And I know it's just not possible for so many of us. And that's not the point I'm trying to make. My point is this. How can I have that desire that they had? Not that I could do it every day. Go and we all just quit our jobs and just spend every single day together praising God and going from house to house and doing the same thing. Not that, not that I'm saying we have to do that and neither does the Bible command that. But my question is, how can I have the desire to want to do that? And if you'll think about it, a lot of the things that would work to strengthen a marriage will work to strengthen my attitude and my desire to be what I ought to be as a Christian. Time together, investing more of myself into a marriage. You know, if you go in, as the attitude seems to be so prevalent today, well, you know, we'll give it a try. If it doesn't work, we'll just get divorced. You know, they make it really easy. We'll just get divorced and maybe I'll find another one and we'll just go from there. If that one doesn't work out, then I'll get another one. Well, you know, just that attitude alone, everybody would say, if that's your attitude entering marriage, you're, you're probably not going to make it. But if your attitude is, I'm going to do everything. I'm going to give myself to make this marriage work. And if the husband and wife both do that, then that marriage has a good chance of making it, doesn't it? If they both have that attitude, it will make it. Imagine if all of us, every member of just the Forest Hill Church of Christ, we'll just make it very local because that's what we're talking about, keeping the local church strong. If everybody had this type, I'm going to invest myself to make the Forest Hill Church of Christ everything she can be. Think we'd grow? Think we'd get stronger? 
You think we would attract those from outside, seeing the things that are being done on the inside and going out to others? You think that would be attractive? What about communication? I'm going to communicate better with my wife. You think that would help a marriage? How would that help the church if we communicated with each other more? And you know, that's one of the things that... Um, I noticed about this congregation in a very positive way when we first moved here. This is a very card-writing congregation, and it's awesome. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. I've gotten thank you cards, and I know you probably have as well, for sending somebody a card <laughs> since I've been here. And so some of us, you're so far ahead of me, I've got to catch up and learn from you. But what about if we communicated with one another? Man, we've got these little things, and we usually, preachers, will just talk nothing but nasty about these things. And the reason is because there's a lot of nastiness that can be done with these things. But you know, we can text somebody in about five seconds just to let them know we're thinking of them, praying for them, and appreciate them. What happened if we started doing that more amongst each other? Think that would help? Yeah, it absolutely would. Communication. And then just think about some other things on your own that would, would improve a marriage. And think about how that would improve the local congregation. Those three things. There's more. You can talk about the army of Christ. And we could talk about that. But those three things. I want us to really think about a home. And, and what I want us to get from that point is... We've never arrived. That's exactly what Paul, forgetting those things that are behind, I press forward, I press on for the mark of the high calling. There's always work to do in the home. Number two is we think about the body. Every person here, and, and this is not just talk. Every person is valuable. If you're a member of this congregation, you have a valuable part. And I know it's difficult to find your place at times, but, but you have things that you're able to do that none of the rest of us have. Do something. Be involved. Ask the elders. Ask the deacons. What can I do? And, and there'll be a job for you. And then you think about the marriage. You know, I uh, saved, in my opinion, you know, just, I think... My favorite illustration about the church, of course, is that marriage. And, and you think about husband loves your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. I can't think of just a command in anywhere in the Bible that comes with more weight than that. Can you? Husbands love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church. How much did Christ love the church? Well, it answers us. He gave himself for her. And if the church is that important to Christ, well, it ought to be important to me. Let this be a time of rejuvenation and thinking about um, what more we can do to strengthen, strengthen the church here at Forest Hill and keep it strong for many, many years to come. Boy, this church has just been a beacon of, of truth in this area for years and years and years. Pray God it continues until this world ends. And if we want to make sure that our children and our grandchildren and great-grandchildren have a place that's just as good as what we enjoy now, well, then it takes some work, doesn't it? Let's be more dedicated if we need to be. And uh, it might just be that there's someone here today that has not been dedicated to the bride of Christ. And this would be a perfect time to rededicate yourself to the work of the church. We can pray with you and for you if you would like to come down and have a seat in the front pew. We'll take care of that need right now. Perhaps you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ. You can do that today. You can become a part of the bride of Christ by obeying the gospel today. Do you believe? Will you repent? Will you confess? And will you be baptized into Christ? We hope that you will while together we stand and sing.